got uh, 332,000 miles on the CRV, Bill. My Honda I got in 2011 when a deer took out my previous vehicle on Route 45 on my way in one morning between Shepherdstown and Martinsburg. Deer came right out of the woods and <laughs> crashed right into it, they, totaled the car. Deer tend to do that. Never the driver, never the driver. It's the deer that runs into it. <laughs> That's what happened. I mean, it's unusual that I'd be going down the road and one would be standing there and I'd just plow right through it. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, those those stupid deer, you'd expect them to learn enough to get out of the way, right? Yeah, I would expect that they would have evolved to, enough to look both ways before they crossed yeah. the street. How much sympathy do you think you're going to get with this conversation? I think financial Phil feels bad for me. <laughs> oh, financial Phil is such a nice guy. He will feel bad for you. Philly, good morning to you. for the deer. <laughs> I don't care. for the deer. You got a new car out of it. The deer probably died. Phil, I got, what I got out of it was a car payment I didn't used to have. That's what I got out of it. Now, this is a dozen years ago. I'm long since paid off uh, on the thing because my, my uh, people say, what's, what's the best car? What's your favorite car? And my answer is always a paid off car. No nope. answer. No payment, baby. <laughs> long since, uh, by the way, that was, that's 12 years ago. Uh, so I, I would have hoped that deer would have evolved enough to understand you just don't sprint all willy-nilly anywhere you want to go. Shouldn't that be a lesson that adult deer teach their ch their children? Well, you know? not if the adult deer run out in the road. They're not there to teach their children, Rob, and that's the problem. <laughs> they just, the other deer are just looking for their parents. I mean, you <laughs> killed their parents, and now they're out looking for I them. Didn't, look, I didn't <laughs> kill you. If you run in front of my car, I didn't kill you. You, you killed yourself. You killed Bambi's mother, Rob. There's no way to get away from that. <laughs> when, when people tell me they went hunting. to teach them. It's not as if there's a, a deer with a limp that's going around like, hey, look, people, we got to talk about this. They normally don't this, live. This one, uh, I, I got to tell you something, man. If you're running in front of people's cars, it's not my fault. I, this, that's this, what my point was. What yeah, I was going to say was, I, if, when I talk to people who go hunting, and they go, I didn't get anything, I'm there like, but you, I did. You could I have did. at least Ow. killed something on your way to where you went to hunt. <laughs> this conversation went south and you, didn't it, Rob? <laughs> I'm just saying. I think that maybe deer should be a little smarter. Mm -hmm. You just don't sprint anywhere you want to sprint. You know what? We need a deer foster care program because I don't think these deer parents are teaching their kids well, Phil. Just something. Well, they're, they're not because, I mean, the parents don't know until they get hit. And if they get hit, they normally pass away. <laughs> There's a couple so who survive. Who's, who's, who's there to teach the kids? Well, they should have observed it. I mean, it's not, you know, just watch. <laughs> Look, that's a bad idea. Don't do it yourself. Bad, bad idea, idea, Captain. Captain. Right? Yeah, that's right. yeah. You know, I, I mean. Haven't said that you could have been on the lookout for deer too it does it goes both ways now you know that they have a propensity for running out in the middle of the road you could have been looking so you want me to go like five miles an hour down the road i mean had you been you might not have totaled your car all right here's what i want you to do try to drive try to try to drive nah, the I'm speed gonna, limit i'm going to back out of this because it's going to be bad karma i'm going to hit a deer uh -huh. and and then i'm then i'll have no one to complain to so i take it back yes rob they are Stupid, stupid Thank you. Because otherwise, Phil, I was going to sentence you to this: get on any road and drive the speed limit. Set your set your cruise control on speed limit and find out how long you can actually do that without someone trying to set up shop in your trunk. <laughs> or a deer. Anyway, this hey, this is a big week. This is a big week financially. Yeah, a lot of stuff week. coming down the pike. There's so, there's so much stuff coming this week that it, it's it's going to be difficult to keep up with it with company earnings. The Federal Reserve making a policy decision on Wednesday. Now, we expect, I mean, a strong possibility, probability, that they're going to increase rates a quarter of a percent. It's going to be what they say after that that would be the, the main mover of the markets. We get two uh, we get a GDP numbers. We get two readings for consumer confidence and more inflation data with the PCE. So it is a full, packed week. You know, in the past, we've had, like, let's focus on earnings or let's focus on inflation or let's focus on what the Federal Reserve is doing. For this week, it's all hitting at one time. And so it, it will be a huge week and difficult to keep up with what has moved our markets and, and what it exactly is going on today. The headline will be the Federal Reserve, though. We, we know we're going to get a quarter percent increase. Is, and that, is that it? And then do we just ride out these rates for a year, year and a half before we start cutting rates again? Well, and I'm, it's going to be data-driven, of course, and that data being the CPI and the PPI and the PCA and the jobless claims and, and all this stuff that we've spent so much time talking about. 
but what he says after the rate increase will will be you know that that give us some indication of what's in their head. Billy, you have a question for Philly. Yeah, I do, uh, Phil. Uh, Phil, with the uh, uh, with the upcoming elections, there's been some talk. Uh, I think kind of the underbrush, but it's going to emerge more and more in Social Security. There's coming two. Uh, couple of schools of thought to preserve Social Security are going to have to make radical changes. Uh, how should the typical fi- uh, individual uh, 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 gear their, their finance and their investment to take into account potential changes in, in uh, radical change in Social Security? Yeah, that, that's a great question because Social Security is a huge, huge issue for uh, Americans, all, not only that's on Social Security, they're probably the safest, by the way, the people that are already on, but those leading up to Social Security, maybe those in my age, uh, you know, their mid-40s, we would be in a hot seat for uh, either decrease in benefits or extending out the ages in which we can we can obtain Social Security. And that's there's a lot of ideas floating around. One would be, and of course the easiest thing would be to increase the Social Security tax. Right now, our Social Security tax is 6.2% up to a wage of, I think it's $160,200 for this year. After you've surpassed $160,200, you no longer pay Social Security tax. And then the other part of it is coming from your employer. They're also paying that. So you've got 12.4% of what you earn that's going into the Social Security program. So one school of thought is we have to increase that because as it stands right now, actuaries say that it's going to run out or full benefits would run out fully solvent by the year 2034. And at that point, they expect that they would be able to pay about three-fourths of the Social Security benefits. But Social Security, is, is it, it's multi-layered with what it means. You know, you can't have your your own Social Security but who's entitled to pick up or benefit from your Social Security as well, whether it be a spouse, ex-spouses, notice I had throw, threw an S on there, ex-spouses could be uh, uh, potential uh, recipients from your Social Security. Your own parents could be recipients of your Social Security if you're providing more than half of their um, more than half of their support and they're living with you if you have a child while you're on social security they're also entitled to it so there's all these arms that go out from social security that have basically have made it to to this point where it's insolvent and uh, work will be insolvent by year 2034 and that's it, it, a really hot topic when it comes to politics because no matter what you do you're going to really hurt someone or a class of people's feelings by changing how this current social security system works, but it is what it is. And man, I certainly hope that that is on the forefront because that is a problem that's looming. And the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be to repair it. But educating yourself on what you have available to you for your age group, when can I turn it on? How much am I allowed to work after I turn it on? What are the repercussions if I turn it on, uh, at age 62 and continue to work or how long do I have to live to make up that difference because of course at age 62 is the first age in which you can turn on your social security but that's early so you receive a reduced payment for your social security and then at age set for most of us it's age 67 or around about age 67 that is the full social security age and and simply what that means it's not the max benefit you can get but at that point, you can work as much as your little heart desires, and you're not penalized for it, or they don't take away some of your benefit because you earn too much. And then the max Social Security payment that you can get is at age 70. And there's a lot of things that go into play on when should I turn it on? Should I turn it on at 62? Should I about 65 when my Medicare is available, or 67, or should I wait to age 70? There's so many things that play into that. One is how would you fill the gap if you allow your Social Security to grow? Two, do, you, do I intend on working or I'll need to go back to work and how much am I able to make? And probably the most important is your health. You know, that plays a huge role into it. If you're an extremely healthy person and you're out here running marathons and you're thinking, well, I'm going to turn it on at 62, well, maybe, maybe you should wait if you've got a means to provide for yourself in the, in the interim. You know, a lot of people, you know, this is something we run into quite often, 
is I want to allow my Social Security benefit to grow. But in the meantime, I need to, I need a supplement to my income. So I'm going to pull money out of my savings, my IRAs or my Roth accounts or whatever it may be, in order to allow my Social Security to grow. And typically that's a bad response because those assets, your IRAs, your Roths, your savings, are inheritable assets. Someone can inherit those. But once you pass away, other than pick up on your benefit, then the, there is no lump sum that your spouse or children can pick up. So you're depleting inheritable assets. But, man, it, it is a multi-layered question and one that we as financial planners we talk about on a daily basis as a matter of fact you tell your 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 timing of your questions perfect because this thursday we have a social security webinar that's available for everyone it doesn't have to be a client of ours but it's just education about social security as you gear up for retirement and what role it plays and it's going to play a role you know, this, this idea that, hey, don't count on your Social Security or don't use it in retirement planning, well, that's not exactly accurate. The uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be there. And, and I would be one that would argue it's going to be there in 2034 as well. They, they would do some. The easiest solution would be to just increase the taxes for which we pay right now to keep it solvent. And it, But if they, don't, if they don't address this subject now, the longer they wait, the the more difficult it's going to be to repair it. Phil, how would uh, if somebody wants to uh, participate with your your Thursday discussion on Social Security, how would they get access? It is uh, Thursday evening from six o'clock to seven, and it's done by webinar. So you would just simply call our office at three zero four two six three four three four three, and we can send you a link to that. It's free of charge; uh, doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to be a client. Of course, our clients will, will be participating. You don't have to speak. No one's going to put you on, uh, on, on, on blast and ask you a question. But you would have a, a, the ability to ask a question if you want. So if you are gearing up for Social Security or if you're, or if you're early on in Social Security and you don't fully understand your benefits, if you're a spouse, like I'm, on the, I'm not on Social Security, but if I were on Social Security and my spouse not quite yet, what are her options, you know, as, in regards to my Social Security? How about my children? I have a disabled child or, or anything of that nature. What are their options? All of that should be covered on this. So almost everyone is touched in some way. And you could say, well, what about a 30-year-old? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that that would be covered in our webinar, but 30 people of that age group should be concerned. You know, what are they going to do uh, to Social Security to ensure that it's there when when I retire, you know, and you know, we, Social Security is a hot topic because all, all the people that can you know, latch on or, or get benefits from one person, uh, it, it, it's staggering if you really dig into it and see how many can get onto it. But our Social Security system was basically broken from the very beginning. John likes to tell the story of Ida Mae Fuller, who was the first Social Security recipient, and she started payments, I want to say, in 1940. Don't hold me to that. But she ended up getting over 22000 I think, in Social Security benefits during her lifetime. However, she put $24.75 into the system. And it works just like a pension system. That's what Social Security is. And at some point, that system has to have wins, meaning it didn't pay out as much as what was paid in. That has to happen. But under the current, the, the way that it works, it happens very, very few times uh, simply because of all the people, even after you pass, that that can be on your Social Security. Now, there's some that makes a lot of sense. You have a, a husband and wife situation where one was stayed at home with the children, whether it be the husband or wife, it doesn't really matter. They're entitled to half of the spouse's benefit, and, I, you know, that would be fair. Um, but it also goes to divorced spouses if they were married for the appropriate amount of time. And up to three, I think, they have divorced spouses that could be on uh, that one person's Social Security. And after that person dies, the, the current spouse is entitled or in the divorce to the full amount. So there's all these different layers to it that, so, that needs some type of repair but like I said before, it's been a hot topic because to bring it up as a politician when you're running for office, it's going to alienate a, a certain group of people, and it could be spun 
to where they're really attacking a certain group of people as it pertains to Social Security. Yeah, I, it is going to be a political hot, uh, political hot topic. Uh, looking at it from a different perspective altogether, uh, uh, with the uncertainties that we have in Social Security and the uncertainties of the future of Social Security, for investors such as in your age group or in, the, in their 30s, is there some tweaking or some adjustment that you suggest they should make to compensate for the uncertainty that we see in Social Security? Well, and it, it, it does boil down to, and I, and I appreciate you saying that my age group in the 30s, I have to admit out loud, even though I like to say I'm younger than I am, I'm, I'm almost 50 now. But the uh, I, Excuse me, I did say and the 30s. I did not oh, say. Oh, man, I thought you, Bill, on it, I thought you were putting me in that age group. No, now. no, I no. you were giving me a compliment. <laughs> no, okay. no, the, it, and it really just boils down to save as much as you can without being investment poor. Um, as you go through, especially early on in life, the earlier you are, you know, there's a saying that we have, you need one of two things, a lot of time or a lot of money. And when you're very, very young, you have them both. Uh, you have a lot of money simply because you don't have a lot of debt. You don't have a lot of responsibilities quite yet. And I'm thinking of those that just entered the workforce. It's not married. They don't have children. They don't have a mortgage quite yet. So there's a lot of discretionary income. And I'll play that back. And it it sounds bizarre, but one of the things that we like to talk to our clients most about is their children saving. You know, if you have a 16-year-old that's working um, at the grocery store for the summer and they have no financial responsibilities other than those the ones that you placed on them, you know, saving a little bit at that time goes a really long way. And if you're able to do that, where you're not reliant upon Social Security, you know, to say there's a difference in in in, in this Social Security and retirement idea. One is don't be reliant on it. If you can be self-sufficient without Social Security, any issues with it may not have a huge impact on you, but it is going to be a part of your financial future. Whether it's a huge part or not, uh, it will be some sort of part of your financial future. And I just have a hard time wrapping my head around that it's not going to be there. I think it will be there, but what will it look like by the time my age group gets there or those in the 30s or the 20s i think people that are on it right now are just i just think they're safe you know and not to get political but that's their big uh, largest voting population or those that are on social security I, i'd have a hard time believing that they're going to reduce or change those benefits for that for that that group of people simply because they're the ones that's going to vote them in or out of office there are people every year who say we need to raise the cap on social security and uh, tax more of it and the fact of the matter is they do that, and they do it nearly every year. In fact, this past year, we had the single largest cap increase in Social Security that we've ever had. It went up $13,200 from 2022 to 2023. And this year it is, as you pointed out, Phil, $160,200. Everything you earn up to that is subject to Social Security tax. That amount started out in 1937 as $3,000, and it stayed that way through 1950. And even into 1980, it was $25,900. In 79, which was the first year I got a job where they were taking taxes out of my paycheck, it was $22,900. But let's go back to 1980. If you take $25,900 in 1980 and you put it into a calculator and say, what is $25,900 in 1980 worth today? The answer is $100,000 plus a little bit more. Okay. Um, but you look at the value, it's 100222 but yet the Social Security cap during that same time went from $25,900 to $160,200, 60% higher than the $100,000 that inflation says it would be. Now, Social Security is adjusted based on their own formula. It was done according to statute from 37 to 74, and again for a couple of years around the late 70s and 80s when they fixed Social Security the first uh, or the last time that they really addressed it. And I, I guess the question that, that is in there is how much money do we want to keep taking from people? Because at one point along the way, your health care insurance premiums were fairly affordable. And your rent might have been too. But at this point, it's not unusual to be paying a health care uh, health insurance premium, if you have a family, of $2,000 or more per month. 
And it'd be one thing if it held there so you could budget for it, but it doesn't. It continued to, es to escalate above the cost of inflation. Your rent has escalated above and beyond the equivalent in inflation. So the house payment that you might have had that was $1,500 a month could now easily be over $3,500, $4,000 a month. Look at the price of a new car now. 50 something thousand dollars is the average. Want to buy a used car? Be prepared to buy something with a ton of miles on it for what used to be the price of a new car. Okay? So if we want to continue to keep taking more money out of people's paychecks, because we're doing that, if we want to continue to uh, have an economy where the price of everything has gone up astronomically, and then we want to keep on taking more taxes out for Social Security, we're. What's left? Are we all just well, going to move into a box on the street? And that's the great debate. You know, there's a lot of people that want to privatize Social Security. I think Mitt Romney brought that up when he was running for president years ago. We're privatizing Social Security and, you know, having the forced savings from your employer and yourself, almost like a 401K. But then you would have the ability to pull as little or as much or do with it as you, as you want. And of course, that wasn't very popular. But there is no good answer. For you know what you had just brought up, there there is no good answer, uh, and it, it, whatever is done, if it is done, and I, I, my fear is it gets kicked down the road again. But whatever is done is going to upset a, a group of people, whether it's those currently paying into Social Security, those in the higher income brackets that said, "Hey, you're making me pay more Social Security taxes. I'm not privy to once I retire, of course, because there's a, a, a cap on how much you can earn with Social Security." You know, Donald Trump will earn as much Social Security as um, a, a lot of Americans will, that, that, that reach that, that cap that was once 25000 and it's now one sixty, he gets the same amount as everyone else because they're not just going to pay out millions in Social Security. So there's a limit to that, but there, there's got to be some type of repair or alteration for it or because the longer they wait, the worse off it's going to be. So, and it's something that is, it touches everyone to some extent that, that they have a fear for it or it's going to be a part of their financial future, which is why it's so important to us. So I would encourage those. Again, you don't have to be a client. You don't have to be in Social Security, and you, you don't have to speak on the webinar, but call our office, and we'll send you an invite. It's free to the public. It's free to anyone that would like to join it's just a service that we provide once a quarter where we find a hot topic and try to educate people on it. Going back to your point, Rob, uh, Social Security is so ingrained in our economic fabric now. Uh, and people have, it's no longer a, uh, uh, it, it is a requirement to survive that everybody woven that into the retirement years. Uh, we may be able, we're going to have to probably tweak it, but we cannot eliminate it. Agreed. I agree. Yeah, I, I think we all agree on that. Yeah. And those tweaks are going to be painful for some. For they some. will you be. Know, I, w yeah. I would be one that, with my age group, I would champion pushing that age out because, you know, life expectancy goes further. And I, w I, I want it to be there. So in order for it to be there, if they say, hey, you know, the people in their, in their 40s um, pushing 50, you guys can't retire until 65. I don't know what the age is. Your, your early age would be 65 in lieu of 62, and your full age in lieu of 67 would be 69. I'd be okay with it. I'd huff, and I'm sure a lot of people would 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 huff and complain. But if it's measures like that that's going to ensure that it's going to be there, sign me up. Your age group is probably the one that will be most directly, directly impacted by the tweaks. Yeah, probably, and, and maybe those in their 20 because it's yeah. so far down the road. You know, I look at that age group because – you know, historically, I don't, and I don't know the voting records, and again, I hate to get political, but they don't vote as much. So if you want to, if you want to pick on my age group some, and then let's go down and pick on, you know, the the high school in the 20s and, and mid 20s, and and really tweak those. I don't know that it would have that big of an impact on who gets elected. Quite honestly, they might not even pay attention. We should have the Social Security Lotto. There was a billion dollars in that Powerball jackpot last week. They they split that. There was, you know? yeah. Yeah, with Social Security lotto tickets. Half goes to the winner. The other half goes into the Social Security fund, Phil. That's not a bad idea, Rob. It's not. Hey, I got uh, Delegate Chuck like Hurst on tomorrow. I'm going to push that idea to him. We'll get it started at the state <laughs> level. Keep moving it up to the that, federal level. Out of the box thinking, and I like it. It's what I do, baby. <laughs> Social Security lotto. Phil, how do we reach you for more information, sir? 
Uh, you can reach us for more information about what we do, or if you want to join the Social Security webinar on Thursday at 6 p.m., you can reach us at 304-263-4343, or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue, right here in Martinsburg. Phil, have a great day. Steelers go to training camp this week, I think on Thursday. I can't wait. I'll be I'll be reading about them. What will be the score of the first game they play, Phil? <laughs> 19 to 16. There will be the 49ers. <laughs>